Good evening. Uh, tonight, I'm very proud to introduce to you two of uh, STM's finest, uh, two of our grads we're very proud of. Uh, Susan Bigelow Reynolds holds the Master's in Theological Studies from the STM, as well as a Master's of Education from uh, another Catholic school you may have heard of, the University of Notre Dame. Um, before beginning her doctoral studies, Susan taught middle school in Brownsville, Texas, through uh, Notre Dame's ACE program, the Alliance for Catholic Education. And tomorrow is a very big day for her, so you might want to keep her in your thoughts and prayers. She'll be defending her dissertation for her, the PhD in Theology and Education here at the STM, and her dissertation is entitled Becoming Borderland, Borderland Communities, colon, Ritual Practice and Solidarity in Shared Parishes. And the nice thing is she already has a job lined up. Uh, beginning this fall, Susan will serve as Assistant Professor of Catholic Studies at Emory University's Candler School of Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. Emory is a great school uh, where I got my degree, and I'm very happy to have one of our grads go down there, so represent us well, Susan. Her research examines ritual practice in contexts of difference, marginality, and suffering. Much of her work and pastoral experience is located in multicultural Catholic communities. Central to this work are questions of racial justice, intercultural collaboration, and embodied practice. Susan has also written and lectured extensively in the area of theology and pregnancy loss. Her work has been published in New Theology Review, Lumen et Vita, and multiple pastoral venues. Susan is the mother of two young daughters, Nora, who is three, and Lucy, who is one. Marcus Mesher is Assistant Professor of Christian Ethics at Xavier University in Cincinnati. Now we have his master's degrees, but I have to say he also has a bachelor's degree from a school dear to me, Marquette University, which is where I first met Marcus uh, back when my hair was his color. Uh, Marcus earned a master's in theological studies specializing in Christian ethics as part of the first graduating class at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Marcus completed his doctoral studies in STM's theology and education program, focusing on moral formation to practice the principles of Catholic social teaching. His teaching and scholarship are informed by nearly a decade of experience in parish youth ministry and college campus ministry. Marcus's primary interests, uh, areas of interest include the moral formation of young adults, the relationship between family life and the common good, the demands of solidarity and the preferential option for the poor, and ecological sustainability. He has published articles in the Journal of Catholic Social Thought, the Journal of Moral Theology, and several edited volumes. He is currently working on a book manuscript inspired by Pope Francis's emphasis on building a culture of encounter, entitled The Ethics of Encounter, Christian Neighbor Love as a Practice of Solidarity. That book will be published in 2019 by Lexington Fortress. I should add that Marcus and Susan both have articles that appear in the book Liturgy and Power, published by Orbis Books last year, available at the BC Bookstore table in the back. And it was these articles that planted the seed for tonight's presentation. Marcus is married and the father of Noah, age eight, Benjamin, age five, and Grace, who was born just a few weeks ago. Marcus was still able to make this trip, even with a new baby in the house. And I'm wondering if your wife thinks he ran away and abdicated, but uh, that's another discussion. I think of Susan and Marcus as people who exemplify the best of the School of Theology and Ministry. They do theology and ministry in service of the world. They're parents, scholars, and educators with a strong sense of ministry. So please join me in welcoming Marcus Mesher and Susan Reynolds speaking on Liturgy and Solidarity Beyond Frontiers. Thank you, Tom and Melinda. Thank you for being here tonight. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here this evening back at Boston College. 
I had six amazing years here. I wouldn't be the same person without Boston College and the Society of Jesus and all of the people that I learned from and continue to learn from. So just wanted to start with a profound and sincere word of thanks. So tonight's program will move forward in three steps. I'll begin by tracing some of the historical roots of liturgy and paying attention to the present sociocultural context for thinking about the relationship between liturgy and solidarity. And then Susan will follow, focusing on liturgy as an experience of the borderlands and how parish life, especially in a multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural context, invites us to more inclusive belonging. And then the third step of tonight's program will be open for your own reflection and discussion. And we look forward to whatever seeds we can plant for your insights and questions. So I'd like to begin with just a little bit of context in this Francis moment. We've just celebrated the fifth anniversary of Francis's pontificate. And whenever I think of Francis, I think of an interview he gave to Father Spadaro for America Magazine entitled, A Big Heart Open to God. And Father Spadaro asked Francis, who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio? And Francis's answer was, I am a sinner. That is not a literary genre or figure of speech, I am a sinner. And I was struck by the fact that he introduced himself to the world with those words. Certainly for anyone in the room who's worked through the spiritual exercises, you can hear in Francis that first week of reflecting both on our own sinfulness, but especially God's abundant mercy. And you can see in the last five years, Francis has been inviting us over and again to bask in the unending mercy of God, the superabundant love of God, the steadfast loyalty, profound forgiveness, the generosity, the solidarity of God who is with us and who is best known through mercy. In fact, in Francis's book, the name of God is mercy, Francis writes that mercy is God's identity card. And so in this context, I think it's worth noting that when Francis talks about who he is, he puts forward that identity rooted in sinfulness and in the reception of God's mercy. And his image of the church, he says, is, is not a, a toll booth that gets to decide who gets in or who's worthy of belonging. It's not a fortress, it's not a lab where we try to create the prime conditions for holiness. He describes the church as a field hospital out going into the world to tend to the wounded uh, as a place without frontiers where no one is outside, no one is excluded, no one is unworthy, and a mother to all. In a homily he gave at Lampedusa in 2013, he used the parable of the Good Samaritan to urge Christians and all people of goodwill to burst the soap bubbles of our self-concern. I love that image, and I can imagine a lot of us just being so wrapped up in our busyness, our agenda, our to-do list, where we've been, where we're going, right? That we're just enclosed in these soap bubbles of self-concern. And Francis's call to all of us is to burst those soap bubbles through the culture of encounter, to overcome the globalization of indifference or the globalization of superficiality so that we can draw near to others in need, so that we can be agents of mercy. And obviously, I'm sure you, you're familiar with this phrase that he's been using over the course of the last five years, this call to build a culture of encounter, to draw near one another. And I don't know if you're familiar with the TED Talk he gave a year ago this month, but he was invited by the TED conference. The title of the conference was On the Future, and Francis's talk is entitled, The Only Future Worth Building Includes Everyone. And he hit three points. And the first one was mercy, hearkening back to what he wrote in Evangelii Gaudium, calling for a revolution of tenderness and asking each and every person 
to be artisans for peace, ambassadors of reconciliation, and agents for this revolution of tenderness. And he followed that up by talking about solidarity and asking each person to make that their default attitude, to see in one another a sense of kinship. And he ended it with hope, talking about hope as a doorway to the future or as a flicker of light that shatters the darkness, the promise of tomorrow. And he said that the future relies on you, each and every one of you, to be someone who's open to God's promises and what lies ahead of us. So with that little bit of context in place, I want to turn to the liturgy. And really what's at stake here is a question of belonging or inclusivity Who belongs? And this quote comes from Evangelii Gaudium, where Francis writes that the Eucharist, although certainly the key to the sacramental life, the fullness of the sacramental life, it is not a prize for the perfect or a trophy for the holy, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. And the quote at the bottom of the screen refers to a message that Francis gave for the inaugural World Day of the Poor five months ago. And I love that line, that love has no alibi. It reminds me of the line from Dorothy Day when she said, my love for God is only as great as the love I have for the person I love the least. Inviting all of us to think about how great, how inclusive or expansive our love is and what that has to do with the liturgy. So essentially, I'm just going to raise three questions with the time that I have with you this evening. What is liturgy? Why do we gather? And what do we do? So my first question, what is liturgy? I think, for my part, I have been raised Catholic. Before I went to college, I could count the number of times I had missed Sunday Mass on one hand. And after college, it didn't grow that, by that many. But I had always taken the current cultural context for granted. And in a Eucharistic theology class with John Baldwin, I was able to learn about the historical roots of liturgy and why it matters that we are doing something that Jesus himself did 2,000 years ago. It was news to me, even being a lifelong Catholic, that liturgy means the shared work of the people which implies that I am not a spectator or an observer or witness, someone on the sidelines. When Jane Regan talks about liturgy, she very often uses the analogy of a gas station where people come, they get their fill up, and then they go on their way and only come back when they're feeling empty. And that's not at all what liturgy was like for the first Christians. It was an intentional act for them to be reminded of who Jesus was and what he did and how he lived, that it was about inclusive table fellowship where everyone belonged. So why do we gather? Well, I could go through each and every one of these points, but what I'd like to focus on is that there are theological, Christological, pneumatological, ecclesiological, and certainly moral reasons for why we gather. We remember the Paschal mystery. We reenact God's covenantal bond with creation. We petition the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, give thanks for the foretaste of our destiny, and as the Catechism teaches, we are recommitted to the poor. But I think it's worth noting, especially, that Jesus was someone who ate not just with the lonely or the marginalized or the excluded, not just the poor, but he ate with tax collectors, agents of the empire that were oppressing the Jewish people. He ate with Pharisees, his own critics and enemies. And as Robert Karras claims, Jesus was crucified because of how he ate. That's how countercultural 
his action was to show that no one is unworthy, no one is beyond the pale, no one can be disinvited. And imagining what that meant for those people who had so much stigma or shame, who were then invited or deemed worthy, who were shown that they counted, that they mattered, that they belonged. And this was something the first Christians took very seriously. The Jewish people were restricted from eating with non-Jews because of their dietary habits. And so those first liturgical meals, the agape meals, were intentionally dietary neutral. They were bread, fish, and wine, something that both Jews and Gentiles could enjoy together to try to live into that aspiration that we read in Galatians 3.28, that there is no longer slave or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, but that all are one in Christ. So when we gather for liturgy, what are we doing? Certainly, we are trying to honor the directive that Jesus gives us to do this in memory of me. We remember our identity is shaped by our memory. And so when we gather, we gather to remember who we are, whose we are, and what we're about. We also, though, gather to be intentional about expanding the networks of kinship to make our patterns and practices and relationships ever more inclusive in seeking solidarity. And especially to ensure that there is no one in need among us. St. Paul in the first letter to the Corinthians chapter 11 rails against those in Corinth because some are feasting while others are going without. So we see from the very first years of the Jewish follow, or the Christian followers this connection between the liturgical meal and a commitment to social justice. And then, as you may have heard, we have this command from Augustine in one of his homilies. He says that we are to become what we receive, the body of Christ. These rituals and symbols remind us of our shared identity, that this isn't just true for me as a Christian, but it is true for us, the body of Christ, as a corporal, corporeal, embodied community. I won't go through all of the quotes from all of these uh, theologians over time, but I, I do think it's worth hearing the words of St. John Chrysostom, who, and this, you don't have to look, you know, all the way back centuries to find him because he's being quoted in encyclicals and in the catechism. But Chrysostom says, the temple of your poor neighbor is more holy than the altar on which you celebrate the holy offering. And in another sermon, he says, you dishonor this table when you judge someone else unworthy to take part in this meal. So my point really is to say that even though Susan and I have been working for months and months to figure out what we wanted to say tonight and how we could help make more explicit the connection between liturgy and solidarity, is that essentially this is nothing new that this is going to the very roots of our liturgical tradition that we've inherited. However, <clears throat> be that as it may, that this is what the tradition has been teaching for centuries, I'm not convinced that this is actually the lived experience of liturgy. And I think it's very easy for many in the church to fall to a, into a kind of sacramental optimism, to borrow a phrase from my friend Katie Grimes, also a product of Boston College, that we presume that God will take care of all these problems. 
we fall into this trap of just thinking that there's something magical about the Eucharist and that it, it will take care of everything that ails us. When this is obviously not the case, right? When we look at the body of Christ, we don't necessarily see a spotless, sinless body. But we see, as Thomas Merton wrote, a body of broken bones, a wounded, dirty church. And we can see this in a whole host of areas. We can look at examples of white supremacy, racism, discrimination. We can look at patriarchy and clericalism, homophobia, right? the exclusion of people because of their marital status. In fact, um, when Pope Francis was preparing the bishops for the synods on marriage and family, he, he prepared a 46 questionnaire asking families to reflect on their experience. And if you read through Amoris Laetitia carefully, you'll see that it addresses some of these really deep wounds that the lay faithful feel when they find that the, the liturgy or the Eucharist in particular is a wedge used to divide people, to deem some worthy and others unworthy, whether it's an interfaith marriage or whether it's an instance of divorce or remarriage. Right? Um, even children after their parents' marriage has been annulled, then they wonder about their status. And there are a lot of people who question whether or not they belong. And I think it's worth noting that when we're talking about a body of Christ, we're not talking about something that is made from anything else but fl our flesh, right? Our flesh that is porous. And we have to pay attention to our social context and to think about why it is that we have a body of broken bones. It strikes me as particularly sobering that Martin Luther King called 11 o'clock on Sunday morning America's most segregated hour 50 years ago. And all the data that we have show that nothing has really improved in those 50 years. The most racially diverse um, denomination in America are Catholics. One in five Catholics worship in a diverse parish setting, but everyone else, it's 15% or less who are actually worshiping in a diverse parish setting. And our, our parishes are actually less diverse than our schools and neighborhoods, although Robert Putnam in his book, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, points that inequality and the stratification of people by class, by gender, by uh, ethnicity, uh, race, et cetera, that that's actually growing and that we, we have a, um, a harder time understanding how people who are different from us actually experience the world. There was a poll that came out not that long ago that said that 75% of white Americans said they didn't have a single black friend and that two-thirds of African Americans didn't have a single white friend. So how can we talk about solidarity when we don't have friendships that cross the color line, when we don't really know, much less care about, much less stand in solidarity with people who are different from us? So you can read sociologists who talk about these lifestyle enclaves where we're kind of collecting toward people in ever more homogenous subsets of the population. But I think what's important is that we are talking about liturgy as if it is enacting solidarity without us really partnering in those efforts. One of the things that I can still remember John Baldwin saying after all these years is that a sacrament is always valid, but it is only fecund or potent to the extent that those people who are receiving the sacrament actually use their free will, use their intentionality to cooperate with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Gustavo Gutierrez, when talking about the Eucharist, says that essentially church teaching describes this as an exercise in make-believe, where we connect the liturgy to social justice on the level of ideas, but it doesn't line up with reality. 
So that's part of what Susan and I would like to accomplish tonight, is to figure out how do we translate this from ideas to reality. And I think the place to begin is the imagination. And when I say that word, I'm not sure what you might think. Maybe some of you think of imagination and you think of fantasy or illusion or some alternate reality. But William Lynch reminds us that the imagination is not about fantasy or illusion. It's actually the fruit of our deepest desires. And William Lynch claims that the Christian imagination is an invitation to literally imagine new things with God. Another Jesuit theologian, Michael Paul Gallagher, also writes extensively on the relationship between theology and imagination, describing it as an, a, you know, a liberation into a different wavelength so that we can be ever more perceptive of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, an invitation to a transformed consciousness I think Pope Francis is someone, even though he doesn't talk much about imagination, is certainly someone who witnesses imagination. In fact, he talks extensively about the need to penetrate ambiguity and to reject rigidity. In fact, he says rigid thinking is not divine, that it's okay to explore the messiness of life and to imagine what more is possible. And I had to include this line from the poet Emily Dickinson, who writes that the possible slow fuse is lit by the imagination. And I, I just want to return quickly to Francis, that, that statement, I am a sinner. And you can imagine what it's like to make that your sense of identity, how humbling it is to make that your sense of self, and the posture of radical openness, of dependence, of availability to the God who never tires of loving us or forgiving us, that actually in turning to mercy, mercy is what makes our imagination possible, that we don't have to be confined to our present way of thinking or our present way of living or our past attitudes or habits. We are more than the worst thing we've ever done. We are more than our faults and failings and our limitations. And that if we truly bask and savor the endless, infinite, unconditional mercy of God, then surely more is possible. At this point, I, I think it's also worth thinking about liturgy in terms of synergy especially because so many of us do think of liturgy like Jane Regan describes, right? Going to the gas station, getting your fill up and not really coming back until you feel like you need another fill up. And you hear about these phenomenons of church shopping, trying to find a place with good music or good homilies, right? And we treat the Eucharist, we treat liturgy like just another object to consume just waiting for that Yelp review to help us find the right parish where we can be filled, right? But the problem with thinking about liturgy as something we consume is it renders us entirely passive. And it makes us envision the parish as a place where sacraments are dispensed and all we have to do is show up. And what I really like about the work of Jean Corbon is that he traces a trajectory of synergy through the incarnation, actually beginning with Mary at the Annunciation. Her yes is the beginning of this trajectory of synergy where you see the joint activity of humanity and divinity. And that, that's what the incarnation is ultimately about. Jesus, who is fully human and fully divine, showing us the potential for this human divine synergy, this full availability and willingness to cooperate with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm suggesting tonight is that we make an intentional choice to move from being spectators to stakeholders. That we move from sacramental consumerism to sacramental partnership. 
Synergy relies on this trajectory that begins with kenosis, God emptying God's self, that offer of agopic love, that model of divine power that isn't power over, but power with, an invitation to be empowered. And that in kenosis, Corbon talks about theosis, the process of divinization, whereby when we take up that invitation to kenosis, we become more human and more divine. And that in that process of moving from kenosis to theosis, the end goal is koinonia, a word that we typically translate as communion, but the roots of that word really mean to share things in common. And in fact, some would argue that actually the, the better translation is partnership, partnership between humanity and divinity for the sake of communion, of course, for right relationship. So instead of thinking of liturgy as this market exchange where we show up to get something and then we go on our way, uh, Chauvet invites us to think about it as a symbolic exchange, a gift that is offered, received, and returned, wherein our life is a return gift in thanksgiving for the Eucharist. So what would this look like if we were to take this joint activity seriously? If we were to participate as partners in synergy for solidarity? John Zazulis states that Christ is revealed as truth not in a community, but as a community the very bonds of our relationships, the measure of our love, of our mercy, of our forgiveness, of our courage, compassion, and solidarity. The, the image that you see on the right hand of the screen is a chalice that was made from the, the wood of a shipwrecked boat off the shores of Lampedusa. I was reading an interview that Pope Francis gave not that long ago when he was asked what his initial vision for, the, for being Pope was like, and he said he, he doesn't like to travel. I don't know if you know this, but he only has one lung. He lost a, a lung, well, one of his lobes of his lung when he was young. Um, he's never liked to travel. It gets him out of his routine. He's not comfortable with it. And he imagined when he was Pope, he could just kind of be the same kind of cardinal he was, which was to just kind of be in one place all the time. But he said, I was moved, I was scandalized by the thousands of refugees who are drowning every year, fleeing violence and seeking peace. And so he was invited to the refugee camps off the coast of Sicily on this tiny island of Lampedusa, which is about halfway between Italy and Tunisia. And he could not get over what his presence meant to the people on the island of Lampedusa, especially the refugees, and what they meant to him. And this chalice is made from the wood of one of the boats that capsized, with re refugees drowning, fleeing violence. And um, Dan Grudy, who's a priest at Notre Dame, travels with this chalice to bring it with his talks to talk about uh, the connection between liturgy and solidarity. And he actually added a piece of mesquite wood at the bottom of the chalice to also remind us of the refugees and migrants who are coming to the US-Mexican border, also seeking peace. That mesquite wood is, is from the US-Mexican border. To, to askly invite us to think about when we are celebrating the Eucharist about the status of those crucified peoples of today, and certainly refugees and migrants would qualify, and to ask ourselves who belongs, who counts, who matters, whom am I allowing myself to be encountered by, with whom am I in solidarity, And if we take seriously this command to solidarity, then we have to begin with this focus on encounter. To heal the wounds of this body of broken bones. Willie James Jennings writes of our diseased social imaginary that it's the product of our inability to be intimate, to open ourselves to intimacy. 
And he says that a lot of this is because that for too long, power in the church has been used to oppress. And he uses examples like white supremacy show that the church has been a force of power over rather than power with. And that because this has been an expression of subjugation or domination, that people are afraid to be vulnerable because they, they worry about being exploited or being harmed. And so Willie James Jennings is inviting us to be vulnerable, to be passionate about desiring to belong to someone who is different from me, someone with different political views, someone from a different race or ethnicity, someone from a different socioeconomic class. And to see us connected as bound to each other in kinship. And it's important that if we talk about liturgy as the source and summit of the Christian life, that we think about to what extent liturgy is a ritual and symbol of encounter with God and one another. Who's welcome and who's not? To what extent are we agents of reconciliation, of this revolution of tenderness, of inclusive belonging? And that's how I'd like to end my time, is inviting you to think about how you can be an agent of not just a culture of encounter, that's certainly the first step, allowing ourselves to be reached by another, to draw near to those others in need, much like the Samaritan on that road to Jericho, who goes out of our way and into the ditch to take up the vantage point of the one who's in need, but to move from a culture of encounter to a culture of belonging. Robert Putnam in his book, American Grace, says that there's little empirical evidence to say that people's moral or religious formation is moved by strong exhortations from a pulpit People aren't swayed by data or statistics, but people are shaped by their relationships. We are our relationships. And those networks of belonging, those practices that we share, that's how we build who we are, both personally and collectively. So Susan and I wanted to raise the question about to whom are you responsible and accountable, to whom do you belong? Who belongs to you? Who's included and who's excluded? And how can we move toward a vision where all of us belong? All right, Susan, I'll let you take it from there. Thank you, Marcus, for starting us off with that important work. I, uh, uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here, I have to say. Thank you to Jane, thank you to Melinda. Um, it's wonderful to be back, uh, to be back in Boston and, and here with you all this evening. Uh, in the second part of our time together, uh, I'm gonna begin where Marcus concluded uh, by offering the parish, uh, the ordinary everyday parish, uh, as a sort of practical case study in the convergence of liturgy and solidarity. Francis is a pastor of the borders. This photo is from Francis's February 2016 visit to Juarez, Mexico, uh, just across the US-Mexico border from El Paso. If you take a glance at the image, here Francis is pausing for prayer at a memorial that was erected for those who have died trying to cross the US-Mexico border. The centerpiece of the memorial is this very large iron cross, which is emblazoned with an image of the Holy Family fleeing into exile. It's constructed on a platform that directly overlooks uh, the US-Mexico border, which is the space that's both heavily militarized and also very transnational. About 14,000 people every single day cross back and forth legally uh, for work, for study, uh, to go to school, to, to be with family members, to shop. Uh, so it's this, this deeply complex space. Uh, the beams of this cross uh, evoke the iron beams that uh, in many places along the 2,000 mile US-Mexico border uh, form this two-story high wall that divide uh, our two countries 
as uh, Father Stegman so graciously mentioned in his introduction, um, I spent uh, several years teaching uh, in Brownsville, Texas, which is the southernmost tip of Texas, so right uh, where uh, US and Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico converge. Um, and I actually witnessed, uh, living very, very close to the border, this wall uh, be erected actually from my front yard. I could see it. It's about a mile and a half in from the border. It's not on the border itself, but it was this very haunting image that in some way propelled me to theological study. Um, that's, what a, that's what a profound uh, symbol it became in my mind. What Pope Francis so often offers the church is an embodied interpretation of the gospel in response to the global signs of the times. This image emblematizes in a particularly salient way the gravitational force that's at the heart of Francis's pontificate, which is this constant pull towards the borders, towards the margins, the peripheries. His stance here is powerfully symbolic. It's also quietly subversive. For three minutes, about, he dwells silently in this space charged with the memory of decades and centuries of human suffering and injustice caused by this unnatural division. In so doing, he invites the church, all of us, to dwell there too. Francis invites us, in other words, to make the peripheries the center of our liturgical and pastoral imagination. Dwelling there, as Francis does, what we find is that it is the crucified and risen Christ whom we encounter. Francis's prayer at the border cross was followed by the celebration of mass. The mass was simulcast across the border where a massive crowd gathered in El Paso's Sun Bowl to participate in liturgical solidarity. Many more gathered along the border fence itself. Uh, the Eucharist was distributed simultaneously on both sides of this frontier. The setting of Francis's liturgical and sacramental practice is not extrinsic to its meaning. In other words, Francis's celebration of the mass at the border isn't just about an outward demonstration of solidarity or bridge building making present the fundamental unity of all baptized in Christ, the sacramental act of solidarity forms participants imaginatively into a more expansive, more inclusive understanding of the body of Christ. Francis invites the church to make a preferential option for the in-between spaces, the borderlands, the spaces where nations, where races, cultures, languages, classes, generations, and histories touch. In word and deed, he invites us to view the borders as a locus ecclesiologicus, as a place from which renewed ways of conceiving of and being church emerge, propelled by and guided by the spirit of God. But living, as we do in the shadow of colonialism and in the midst of profound polarization, advocating for a theological commitment to the borderlands is not an easy argument to make. In our distorted national imagination, the specter of the border looms both as a dam, holding back oncoming tides of the undesired other, and as a frontier to be conquered militarily, economically, and culturally. In our national imagination, borderlands are checkpoints, stopping points, endpoints, spaces of danger and suspicion beyond which we dare venture only as missionaries or as tourists, never as equals, lest we too become undesirable. Borders are spaces from which, like Nazareth, we who are formed to fear them come to believe that nothing good could ever come. In our national imagination, then, the architectural form proper to the borderland is not the bridge, but rather the iron fence or the concrete wall. Taught to fear our geographical borderlands, we imbibe in turn a fear of the borderlands that exist within our own near communities, the spaces in our churches, our schools, and our neighborhoods where races, cultures, and classes meet. Such fear must be rejected for the sake of the gospels and for the sake of our souls. Re-envisioning borders not as the spaces where relationships and identities end, but rather where they meet, we are able to see them as spaces infused with the possibility of encounter, conversion, solidarity, and salvation. This theological transvaluation of the border, to use the phrase of Roberto Goizueta, is not merely the replacement of a false negative image of the border with an equally false romanticized one. Rather, it's about coming to see the border as it truly is, a space where the unifying spirit of God breathes new life into the church. Solidarity across borders becomes a real possibility when we approach this joining not as an act of service or of begrudging welcome, but as a soteriological act, a desire for true communion with our neighbors, emphasis on desire. If this is the case, 
Then the question Pope Francis implicitly poses to us, and which I pose to us here this evening, uh, in light of what Marcus so helpfully shared with us, is where are the borderlands in our midst? Where are the borders to which we are being called? It's tempting to believe that this call of missionary discipleship, this outward centrifugal impulse of, of loving encounter, which Francis so often speaks, compels us to journey to somewhere else, <laughs> right? As Americans, our largely racially, culturally, and economically segregated existences encourages the misconception that in order to encounter difference in consequential ways, we need to go far, far away on a mission trip, for example, which have their merits, <laughs> um, and yet, and yet, Right? The notion that the place for solidarity is somewhere else is a deceptive one, right? Because in some way it exculpates us from our responsibility to scrutinize the contours of our own local realities. I wanna suggest that one place we can all respond to the call to solidarity across borders is within our parishes. The adage that Sunday morning in America is the most segregated hour of the week, as Marcus cited for us, has become somewhat of a cliche. But like most cliches, it's essentially true. Studies of American religious congregations have been unequivocal in demonstrating that the majority of Americans worship with people who are racially and culturally similar to themselves. Catholic parishes are, as Marcus said, on average, more diverse than Protestant congregations, but only by a little bit. And the picture isn't much rosier on this side of the fence. The majority of Catholics still worship with people who look mostly like themselves. Yet slowly, this is changing. Today, more than a third of Catholic parishes serve multiple cultural, ethnic, or linguistic communities, a number that's steadily increasing. The one in five number that, uh, that Marcus cited um, has to do mostly with racial diversity, but about a third of parishes serve communities that might not be racially diverse, um, but might be linguistically diverse, a, a French-Canadian community, for example, a Ukrainian community. Colloquially, we tend to refer to such communities as multicultural, but in fact, calling these parishes multicultural is a bit of an overstatement uh, in most cases, as perhaps those of you who belong to such parishes can attest. Uh, typically, typically, not in every case, but typically, cultural and ethnic communities exist in relatively separate spheres, right? The English-speaking community and the Spanish-speaking community. They attend different masses, participate in different ministries, and generally kind of orbit around one another, intersecting for brief moments in the parking lot or maybe once or twice a year at a bilingual mass. Scholars and the US Catholic bishops thus term such parishes shared parishes, uh, because in most cases, that's exactly what they are two, three, sometimes four or more even, uh, cultural sub-communities sharing a space, but often little else. While Catholic parishes have been sites of intense intercultural negotiation for as long as the church has been a presence in what's now the United States, the shared parish phenomenon is a response to a few ongoing transformations in the church that are somewhat unique. First, it's impossible to overstate the significance of the demographic transformation underway in the US Catholic Church, particularly the extent to which Latino Catholics are reshaping the church. Around 38%, so almost 40% of US Catholics are Hispanic or Latino. Overall, according to estimates by the USCCB, more than half, more than half of US Catholics today are not of Euro-American descent. Uh, in other words, most Catholics aren't white. <laughs> Obviously, this is not a reality that's uh, reflected or expressed in most of our Catholic institutions. Latino, African, African-American, and Asian Catholics are in many ways responsible for the continued vitality of Catholicism in the US, especially among younger generations. This reality, of course, is starkly at odds with the continued normativity of white Euro-American cultural expressions, practices, and leadership in the church. Second, models of parish life have changed. While the coexistence of multiple cultural communities in a single parish is not new, this model of the shared parish is a community of communities, so to speak, is becoming increasingly common. In the past, particularly in dioceses, uh, like in the Northeast, for example, in regions of the country where the establishment of national and ethnic parishes was most common, uh, the sharing of a single parish by multiple, multiple cultural groups was often understood as an interim state, a temporary arrangement until a group could petition the bishop for a, a parish of their own, a Polish parish, for example, an Irish parish, a German parish. Uh, when national parishes were not an option, uh, efficient Americanization of the newcomers was the goal. Today, uh, the culturally shared parish is not a temporary arrangement, but a unique and emerging model of parish life in its own right. 
uh, yet the coexistence of multiple cultural communities in a single parish still feels in many ways like an ad hoc arrangement, something that no one really chose, nobody really set up in advance, but uh, kind of works for the time being, but still has this sense of tentativeness about it. Uh, whenever I speak to, to almost anyone who belongs to or ministers at a parish like this, most of the time they express kind of mild discomfort over the fact that they belong to the same parish as an entire group of people that they don't know at all and have no contact with whatsoever based solely on the fact of their ethnicity or language. Most acknowledge that they don't know what to do about it or where to start, but the discomfort is there. Um, so that's something. Third, attitudinal and ideological shifts have occurred both within the church and broader society. Generally speaking, attitudes with respect to cultural diversity have shifted away from assimilationism and toward at least a nominal appreciation of cultural diversity. Uh, in recent years, uh, bishops have expressed the notion of unity and diversity through frameworks such as interculturalism, integration, and communion. So these aren't just abstract trends, right? Many of you here this evening are likely experiencing this reality firsthand in your own parishes, an English-speaking community and a Spanish-speaking community, or a Brazilian community, or a Korean community. If you're a parishioner at St. Ignatius, uh, or St. Columkill, or St. Mary of the Angels, you belong to a shared parish. Uh, in the Archdiocese of Boston alone, for example, uh, parishes minister to at least 27 distinct cultural communities, uh, if not more, including Vietnamese, Haitian, Kenyan, Nigerian, Cape Verdean, Korean, Filipino, Polish, and Italian Catholics, uh, just to name a few. But even for those of you who don't currently belong to a culturally shared parish, this question of community and diversity remains highly relevant. Right here in Boston, parish mergers and clusterings have meant that all of us here likely have been faced in some way with this, this question or this task of forming community and difference, whether that difference is ideological or spiritual or organizational. The parish is traditionally defined as a stable community of the faithful, which almost sounds a little laughable <laughs> given the state of our parishes uh, in the archdiocese right now. We're in a state of so much flux, right? Today we see that the parish is also a place of ambiguity, of change, of uncertainty. Our parishes are in some real sense the borderlands in our midst or one site of borderland identity in our midst. If we're committed to Pope Francis's vision of a church that's without frontiers and a mother to all, then our parishes, which for most of us uh, form our most consistent and intimate connection with that church, should be the primary locus of this solidaristic task. Perhaps more so than any other institution, parishes are places where we're invited into the challenging task of joining with and loving other people in their difference. This is not easy. This is very different than the nice sounding suggestion that we should celebrate diversity, which demands nothing more of us than general tolerance of the existence of people who are not us. Solidarity and difference requires, in the words of John Sabrino, a true conversion to the neighbor, right? a willingness to be challenged in our presumptions of normativity, a willingness to be the guest in the very place where we're used to being the host. So given the theme, of this evening, how can liturgy help to, bridge, uh, to build bridges across borders in our parishes? Uh, asked another way, at least as it's been asked by social scientists, how does ritual produce social solidarity? Produce, of course, is in quotation marks because uh, as Marcus helpfully pointed out to us, uh, liturgy on its own doesn't produce anything uh, like an equation or a magic trick, right? So this is the social scientist speak that isn't exactly reflected theologically, right? If it did, if, if, if ritual simply produced solidarity, then the problem of community and diversity in parishes would be a very easy one to solve. Yet research suggests that ritual does play a critical role in cultivating and strengthening social bonds. There's a great deal of research to support the idea that participating in long-standing pre-established rituals leads to intergroup cooperation. So for example, when a small faith sharing group uh, recites the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of each meeting, right? the research suggests that uh, performing that ritual action consistently helps them to strengthen their bonds as a group. Right? If you're a Girl Scout, you recite the Girl Scout law at the beginning of each meeting. If you're in the Kiwanis Club, you recite the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever, right? And we sense that, okay, something about this it helps us to feel at home, right? It helps us to feel a shared sense of belonging. However, a recent study also suggests that new rituals, brand new rituals in newly formed groups, so among people that don't know each other, that have no prior knowledge of one another, can also promote intergroup bonding. 
Uh, in other words, this study found that when uh, they took people who didn't know one another at all, put them in small groups, um, and had some begin their time together, whatever they were doing, with um, a, some sort of made-up ritual, something that they had just put together and said, okay, you begin each time you meet with this ritual, and the other group didn't. And by the end, uh, the group that performed this brand new prior meaningless ritual um, actually evinced higher levels of solidarity and intergroup bonding. So ritual is efficacious, even in secular settings. So there's something very important to be considered there. Scholars of diverse congregations have also pointed to the vital role of ritual practice in cultivating community in contexts of difference, right? And of course, this probably doesn't surprise us. Sociologist of religion, R. Stephen Warner, emphasizes the crucial role of embodied ritual, embodied, uh, as a key to the capacity religion has to bridge boundaries both between communities and individuals. Chris Tires, scholar of pragmatist thought in US Latino religion, argues that the spiritual and moral power of popular religious rituals is related to their capacity to become sites of integration and boundary transgression. When distinctions between us and them are ritually transgressed, people are moved at the moral level through feelings of deep solidarity and empathy. Practical wisdom also affirms this connection between ritual and community. In shared parishes, bilingual liturgies often represent best attempts to build bridges between members of distinct linguistic communities. Bilingual masses can be onerous, right? They can be imperfect, especially where such practices are not the norm. But the significance of such efforts shouldn't be overlooked. Indeed, such attempts at fostering community through shared linguistically inclusive liturgical participation evince an instinct similar to those elaborated by scholars. We sense that we become community by doing community. So how does liturgical participation enable us to do community? Religious studies scholars Adam Seligman and anthropologist Robert Weller, both of, at BU, a local institution, conceive of ritual as subjunctive action. Those of you who are Spanish speakers will find that more immediately meaningful than those of you who are not, but I will explain what I mean. By this, they mean that ritual is the embodied, imaginative construction of a shared as-if reality. Their work follows that of Catherine Bell, whose classic ritual theory, ritual practice, conceptualizes ritual as a kind of practice, right, where power relationships aren't merely symbolized or suspended, but actively negotiated. Seligman and Weller suggest that ritual should be understood as a particular way of framing actions, rather than as the performance of a commonly held set of meanings or values. Ritual is about doing something together more than it's about saying something together. It's the doing itself that lends ritual its power and meaning. This also means that far from consolidating group identities and values in a uniform way, ritual should instead be understood as disclosing a unique capacity to encompass and mediate difference without seeking necessarily to resolve it. Shared participation in ritual doesn't require that all participants hold an identical set of meanings or identities in order to participate. In contexts of profound diversity, which is to say in the absence of commonly agreed upon meanings, language, or symbols, ritual can be efficacious precisely because through embodied participation, they integrate participants holistically and non-discursively into a shared subjunctive reality. They provide us a template, a script for acting like the kind of community that we hope to become, right? We practice becoming what we receive. Seligman and, uh, and Weller argue that the work of ritual teaches us how to live within and between different boundaries rather than seeking to absolutize them. Ritual in this sense can be compared to play, a joyful creative imagining of a world that could be, that might be. We act like community and we do it over and over and over again. We practice becoming a community. Ritual becomes, in other words, the language of community. And it doesn't require that you give up your culture or I give up my culture, that we coexist in perfect harmony. It means that we practice doing life together. It's a kind of practice. And I love that image, actually, of liturgy as a kind of practice. We talk about this in academics, speak liturgical practice, um, right? But what's practice, right? You're trying. You're trying again and again and again, just like you practice piano or you practice softball. And that kind of practice can be transformative. As Virgil Elizondo writes, through ritual participation and celebration, we begin to experience a new kind of we, a new kind of belonging. Right? It's an experience of community that emerges in practice before it emerges in theory. It's lived before it's understood. Liturgy, as Marcus told us, 
is the work of the people. Liturgy in context of diversity is the hard work of the people. And as one woman I interviewed put it, we have to work hard at figuring out how we hear one another's voices. So to conclude, uh, in my pastoral experience and in my research, uh, intercultural liturgy works, so to speak, uh, when uh, five things are true. And this is not a limited list necessarily, but this is what I found. It works when it's highly embodied. Uh, so accenting the highly embodied participatory elements of the liturgy, processions, the sign of peace, for example, and developing new embodied rituals within the liturgy gives parishioners the opportunity to touch, to embrace, to walk together in a, in a literal way. Again, drawing our imaginations into a more intimate, more consequential understanding of what it means to call ourselves the body of Christ. Intercultural liturgy works when it's highly participatory, right? Typically, we don't like too many cooks in the kitchen. It makes things messy. But ironically, um, and perhaps in contrast to our desire for control and seamlessness uh, in our liturgies, uh, the more lay people who are involved from all cultural communities in a parish in liturgical planning, implementation, and evaluation, the better. Right? Giving people roles, even if they're small, but very, very specific, gets skin in the game. It makes people stakeholders in this work of the people that Marcus spoke of. Plus, relationships are formed this way during these meetings, these planning meetings, these evaluations. That's where these relationships are formed. Third, <laughs> intercultural liturgy works best when people expect discomfort and imperfection. Right? Uh, in corporate speak, I think this is called managing expectations. <laughs> uh, even people who've been doing this for decades, and uh, through the, the research that I did for my dissertation, I had the gift of talking to a lot of people who have been doing this for decades. Even they talk about how they always expect it to be seamless, the best laid plans of mice and men, and then it doesn't. Somebody reads the same part twice. An entire page of the passion was skipped accidentally, right? There's <laughs> There's a long, awkward pause between the first reading and the second reading. It's not perfect, right? But it's practice, right? Things, it's, it's worth doing. Uh, number four, uh, intercultural liturgy works when it's done in conjunction with a larger vision or mission of intercultural collaboration at the parish. As we've said, I think, nine times now, liturgy isn't a magic trick. It has to be part of a broader structural effort at a parish to enact justice and intercultural collaboration at all levels of parish life, from equity and compensation to empowered leadership, from representation and decision-making to culturally responsive ministry. And finally, intercultural liturgy works when it's supplemented by opportunities for celebration and social life, right? Wherein people come to form friendships and come to genuinely care each other, care about each other, right? To desire one another's friendship desire one another's fellowship and presence and belonging. Right? We don't practice solidarity to be politically correct, or to celebrate diversity in some benign kind of way. Right? We do so because we believe that salvation is communal. Right? Solidarity is an expression of our peoplehood, the fullness of that communion united across near and distant borders as the body of Christ. Thank you. All right, so let's, let's open it up. There's a microphone that is back there. If we all direct our attention to the back. Um, uh, if anyone feels moved, um, we would love to, uh, to hear some thoughts, some pieces of the conversations that you just had, um, share your own experiences, kind of bring it to the table, because that's, that's what this is all about. So if you put your hand up and you'll, and you'll receive the microphone. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Uh, in uh, the, you know, the research you've done, and uh, certainly I'm sure you've traveled around, why uh, did you not mention the beauty of base Christian communities? And why haven't we adopted that uh, in most parts of the United States? 
That's a that's a great question, and I think uh, people who know much more about you know the BCCs than I do have have reflected on that. There there's some of of um, elements of the base Christian communities I think have have t been tried and, and worked, I think, in certain contexts. Um, and in other ways, I think um, people have found that there's something about that model that for some reason has flourished most successfully in Latin America and in Africa um, in particular. But I think that that you're wise in, in drawing our attention to the power of encounter that happens in these small communities. Um, I know that I have witnessed this model of practice in, in just in travels that I've done in East Africa and in Brazil. Um, and in both of those cases, the people who I've been with have named that community as, as just this very, very powerful and really life course shaping site of encounter with one another and with God. Um, and I, I think that you're wise, again, to direct our attention to, to the capacity of these small groups, which uh, you know, is, a, is a space for, for those kind of relationships. I don't know if you have any background on that as well. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Uh, it's something I'm really interested in. And I, I think I'll just make a couple quick remarks. The first is that, as Susan alluded to, we see base ecclesial communities flourish when there's a communal anthropology already in place. Mm -hmm. And a place like, you know, in, in Central or South America where you have this vision of life, um, of conjunto, you know, of togetherness, of convivencia, or in an African context with, you know, I think of the, the Bantu word Ubuntu, I, I am because we are, right? Th that does not square with our um, hyper-individualistic anthropology in the United States. And uh, some of my work is in marriage and family, and what I'm struck by right now is, is how many families report being stressed, busy, and overwhelmed. And in fact, busyness almost becomes like a badge of honor. You know, just, you think you're busy? Let me tell you how busy I am, right? And the one-upsmanship of busyness, that it's become a status symbol, or we have this prestige envy. We live in a very competitive cultural context. That makes base ecclesial communities really difficult. The other point that I would add is Although it's wonderful to focus on these grassroots movements, uh, and Francis is doing that, right? With You can see the synod on the Amazon that will be coming up in a couple of years trying to empower. He gave a number of really amazing talks in Bolivia uh, to, to grassroots organizers and, and really commending the work that they were doing and urging them forward. Um, we also have to find a way from the micro level to complement it with some macro level systems and structures. Otherwise, it's just benevolent chaos. So, so we have to do the both, right, of the micro and the macro. And I, I don't know that we're doing either very well right now uh, in, in at least the United States. And then the third and final thing I would say is I also think that it, it's worth pointing out that base ecclesial communities are dying. And if you go, if you spend time in Central or South America right now, there's something that people talk about being vibrant in the 70s or something that maybe, you know, current grandparents were involved with. But for whatever reason, it's been lost in translation to current generations. And at least as far as I can tell, in places like El Salvador, uh, they're not vibrant and they're not drawing in young people like 40, 50 years ago. So I think there's an important question to figure out what, what is being lost in translation to today's generation, that they're not seeing that as a worthwhile way to spend their time, to build community, to feel like they belong. One, actually, I just, that's, I, that, I, thanks for raising that too, because it, re, it reminded me too, I was reading recently Walter Casper's um, uh, large, excellent volume on the Catholic Church, um, and he talks in there about this crisis that, you know, Northern and Western Europe is undergoing in terms of a, a vast secularization and, and a, just a real loss of, of a, a Christian practice. Um, and he actually proposes a model that's very similar to the base Christian community model. Um, he does not make that connection avert, um, but the, what he proposes is essentially a, a model that's in some ways very reminiscent of this model of kind of the center and then these peripheral communities that really are in some ways their own center of, of faith life for people um, and that aren't necessarily um, you know, clerically led but very familially led. Um, the other thing that I would say too, just thinking more about your question um, in terms of the potential gifts to recover from the BCC model, um, is its intergenerationality. Um, and I think that's, that's a gift of, um, 
particularly the Latino presence right now in, in, the, in the church in the US is drawing us back to this sort of familial, <laughs> um, like whole familial, whole life course, intergenerational experience of, of spirituality. Um, in fact, there's a, 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 one of my junior colleagues in the, in the PhD program at the STM is writing her dissertation on that, and it sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, but in the, in the places where I've witnessed that model still somehow evolved but alive, it's been this very family-based and intergenerational thing that I think is, is something very astute. So thank you for your question. So thank you both. Uh, Eleanor really loved the presentation. She's she was, I was, I, we loved her. Yes, yeah, she was very vocal during some parts. Yeah, very intergenerational. Um, so as I was hearing you, Susan, walk through what a um, bilingual liturgy, sorry, I'll stand over here, bilingual liturgy would look like, I thought to myself, you know, if only in this part of the, the country there were two vibrant communities of, of different cultures that could come together to do this. Like normally there's the one that's dying and the one that's moving in. Um, so, it's, so it's no wonder that like all the church self-help books now are talking about forming evangelizing disciples to go out to a different type of margin than what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. So is there a way then that your conversation today can influence that formation of discipleship so that when they do go out to the margins, it's not just the other people who look like me who don't go to church anymore. Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's a really good question. Um, and in fact, the concern that you raise um, is very much reflected in the data. Um, I'm a big fan of, of the social sciences, as you can tell. Um, but a recent um, sort of a data conducted by the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, CARA out of Georgetown and Washington, D.C., um, Part of what they, they did this wonderful and very, very expansive study recently on the attitudes of Catholics who belong to shared parishes, who belong to diverse parishes, um, and they broke that data down. And what that, essentially, the finding there was that um, white Catholics <laughs> think that their communities are much more integrated and much more successfully uh, sort of just um, than do uh, Catholics of color. Um, which was very interesting. Related to your question, um, when the survey asked, um, who do you think that uh, your parish should be spending more time focusing on attracting um, white Catholics in, in sort of an astounding and frankly a very shameful and embarrassing margin, um, uh, put strongly agree essentially for, um, for divorced and remarried Catholics, for um, you know, youth, uh, for people who um, were married to non-Catholic spouses, for, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people like that. Um, but uh, support declined very, very markedly um, for, uh, you know, outreach to Spanish-speaking Catholics, to Native American Catholics, to Asian Catholics, to immigrants, um, to non-English-speaking Catholics, um, to uh, recently released prisoners. Um, again, there's sort of an implicit racial bias there. Um, and so I, I think the moral of the story is often when you talk to people who are engaging this kind of outreach, we think we're doing a much more uh, just and equitable job than we're actually doing. Um, and so I think particularly, I think sort of returning to the, uh, the praxis of Pope Francis, which, which Marcus really did a, a beautiful and very comprehensive job illuminating for us, um, I think unseats that kind of complacency with the job that we're doing. Um, there's something so powerful um, about his embodied practice, about his actions that sort of convicts us in a way. I know it certainly does for me, um, the humility that he evinces, but also the willingness um, to go to the places that other people reject, um, I think would be the most powerful kind of witness to and, and, and lesson for um, our evangelizing task there. Microphone. I know, but I think I can be heard. Oh, no, that uh, picks you up <laughs> for the video. That's right, for the video. Uh, I'm reading the bottom bullet on, on the presentation, and it may even connect with your last comment. It says, have you participated in multicultural or multilingual worship? What worked? What would you change? And... I think I want to go to the last part that this this 
striving for perfection is what I would change because, because we strive for perfection, we often, tr at least subconsciously, reject those that don't fit into uh, our preconceptions of how things are supposed to be, mm -hmm. or the, the historical uh, practices we had. Mm -hmm. And we're ready to um, criticize things that aren't quite what we expected them to be, what aren't quite what we wanted them to be. I mean, as you know, Susan, we've plenty of times rehearsed for uh, different functions, and come the day, you find out that they didn't understand what I thought I was telling them. Mm -hmm. And where I thought I was having people sit didn't end up being where they ended up sitting. Uh, but it's okay. And, and that's something else that I know I myself have to learn to do is let go and let it be okay. Mm -hmm. Because it's God's church that we are participating in and sharing in and God loves us all with our imperfections and heaven knows none of us is perfect. Amen. <laughs> I can say Joyce could easily be up here giving this talk um, because uh, she is somebody who's taught me a tremendous amount about that exact point. Um, the, the need to uh, not just kind of tolerate imperfection, but actually embrace it. Um, often our rejection of, of things that don't fit into our mold of perfection ends up being a rejection of the other, right? The person who doesn't walk fast enough or upright enough or nice enough to be part of the liturgical procession, right? The person that reads too slow, the person that doesn't speak very clear English or Spanish, perhaps, or whatever the case may be. Um, and and our, our desire for choreography and for good liturgy, and there's nothing wrong with good liturgy, right? <laughs> I came actually um, to, to the parish that I was a member of here uh, and where Joyce uh, has been for many, many years, uh, St. Mary of the Angels, when, when I lived here um, from, uh, from the University of Notre Dame where I was president of the Notre Dame Folk Choir where we sang in the Basilica of the Sacred Heart every 1145 <laughs> on, uh, on Sunday mornings. Um, and I came to a church that was, um, by all accounts, um, and you would not disagree, uh, very economically marginal, very poor. This is a poor church for the poor, by and large. Um, and it unseated my own uh, understanding of, of whose the liturgy is um, and, and by whom that work is done. And I had to go through a very painful process. <laughs> um, and it was not easy um, at times of, of managing my own understanding of how perfect and how choreographed liturgy is supposed to be um, and where that balance between um, between preserving those ritual aspects, which are very important, right? Because we don't want to lose that because as the research has shown us, um, liturgy gives us this, or ritual, liturgy being a part of ritual, gives us a template for being together meaningfully. So if we stray too far from that, people, nobody starts to feel at home, right? And that's an experience of discomfort as well. Um, but so where, where do we find the balance between that and inclusivity, and not just inclusivity in a tokenizing way. Okay, we have somebody who's Spanish speaking, we have somebody who's black, we have somebody who's white, and they all did the readings and therefore we are diverse. No, authentic inclusivity, um, which often involves the inclusion of people who are far more difficult to include or make us far more uncomfortable. Um, and, and that's something to look at too. So thank you for your comment, Joyce. Hi, I'd like to speak to what I think is the current reality of the Archdiocese of Boston when um, we, in the last X years, have had to form collaboratives of two or three or even four churches coming together with very different experiences, having a shared pastor, having experience of pastor with very different um, sense of theology and liturgy than the previous three pastors were. And um, we've experienced that again. I'm St. Mary of the Angels, but I'm part of the Roxbury um, uh, 
uh, Jamaica Plain Collaborative. And we've had wonderful resource of Jesuit priests and deacons who've been part of our community and they continue, both English speakers and Spanish speakers. And then our pastor who took over this is a neocatechumenate. And so we had very, very different ways of looking at church. And we've worked hard at it to try to understand how we can come together and do our best. And certainly not perfect. But I think that's part of the current reality of what church is today, a very different liturgical, theological, philosophical groups of people coming together. So any comments on that would be welcome. Yeah, no, I, I, you're, you're very wise to point us toward those, those borderlines, right, which in some way are more salient than racial or cultural or even linguistic borderlines. The particularly, bless you, given the, the, the contemporary sort of socio-political context in our country, I know that I catch myself having sort of a, an automatic allergy or aversion to anybody who, who seems to, okay, they said this, and I feel like they probably mean this, and they probably voted for this guy, and therefore they probably mean this, and okay, yeah, we're not, no, we don't agree, right? And it's so fast we jump to that. Um, and that, I think right now, is, is a very, very salient dividing line. And that's something that I feel, um, particularly in this, this experience of clustering and collaboratives, right? Often it's, it's these divisions, right? The spiritual or theological or ideological divisions um, that, that become almost more salient um, than, than racial or cultural ones. And you're, and you're wise to, to point us toward that reality in Boston. We're both Spanish and English speakers mm -hmm. with a range of backgrounds and belief systems. Mm -hmm. So you put it all together and it's complicated. It's so complicated. Can I just add too that I think, you know, we've got work to do in what we expect of each other. You know, to go back to the way that I was trying to highlight the co-responsibility of the faithful, more than 50% of Catholics say that their pastor doesn't expect them to do anything for parish life. And two thirds of Catholics say they don't want to take any leadership responsibilities in their parish. So we really have a disempowered laity that, that really has to change. And I think what's interesting about this Francis moment is that he is emphasizing the grassroots. He's, he's encouraging synodality, asking people to, to gather, to listen, to learn from each other. Uh, I mean, Francis is writing encyclicals with his gestures. Just, uh, it slipped, I don't know if on purpose or by accident, but he, he mentioned that he has been meeting with victims of priest ab sexual abuse every Friday. You know, the posture that he's taking, the way that he came out really profusely apologetic about the way he botched the, the abuse scandal in Chile. Um, you know, he calls for a bruised and broken image of the church, but if you Google images of Pope Francis, a lot of them, he's got that black eye from when the, uh, you know, he was you know, in South America and a, and a horse reared up and ran into the Pope Mobile and a police officer fell off her horse and he, without even waiting for the Pope Mobile to stop, Francis was dashing off, uh, off the Pope Mobile to tend to the police woman and to check on her. Right? I, he, he's showing us this way to go out, to engage, to encounter, to listen, to imagine. And I'm hoping that, I mean, his approval ratings are through the roof. I mean, the envy of every politician. I'm hoping that we can move from the Francis moment to the Francis movement, and we can have a, a much more empowered laity who actually take up and appropriate the example that, that Francis is providing us.